So welcome back to the Deposit That Podcast. Um, for those of you who don't know, for the first 30 years of my life, I only really truly respected and admired and wanted to be like one person, and that was my dad. Um, two months prior to turning 31, uh, I called up a guy that I had done business with periodically, and I, for a lack of a better term, said, if you don't get me direct to the fucking money source of who does hard money, I'm going to lose my mind because I'm tired of being jerked around by all these people that say they do hard money and they don't have their own money, right? They're, they're basically raising their own money. So he goes, well, what are you doing tonight? I'm like, well, it's Friday at three o'clock. What do you mean? What am I doing tonight? I don't know. I don't have any plans. He's like, meet me at Rayo's. I'm bringing my money guy. And I said, uh, wow. I'm like, Rayo's, you know, it's a pretty uh, prestigious place to get into it. He's like, yeah, I have a table there. I'm like, hmm, your stock just went up in my mind. So... We ran home, put on a suit and tie, and I drove to Harlem and went to Rayo's. And in walks this very well-dressed, clean-cut guy that I automatically was like, wow, this guy looks like a superstar. And then I heard him speak and saw how smooth he was, and I realized this guy walks like a superstar. Then we continued to have dinner, and I think everyone was drinking wine. I wasn't drinking wine at the time for whatever reason. And you know, it was a nice table. Some people you know, talk a little bit more than others, and I just... Watch how he carried himself, and I listened to the points that when he spoke, he spoke with a purpose. He didn't just speak to speak. And uh, you know, two years later now, almost two years later now, I have the second most male figure that I consider to respect, love, and trust in my life, Michael Beatty. So, Mike, welcome to the show. I appreciate you taking the time out of your busy day in life, and congratulations on your daughter's engagement. Um, thanks for coming on the show. I really, really, truly, from my heart, appreciate it. Glad to be here, Jeff. Always a pleasure. Um, so you remember that night at Rayo's? Sure. Um, you've been back since I haven't. It was once John realized I started sending deals in, he stopped inviting me <laughs> to go to Rayo's. Is that how John works? Got what he wanted. <laughs> John served his purpose for many reasons. John, uh, hopefully you'll be listening. You're probably doing bicep curls at the gym right now or laying in your tanning bed while Mike and I are talking. But uh, we really appreciate you setting up not only the relationship from a business standpoint, but I truly value you for setting up this relationship uh, from a personal friendship standpoint as well. Um, so, Mike, you went from Yonkers, I believe, right? If you grew up Yonkers? East Chester. East Chester, next to Yonkers. Same thing. And uh, into the fashion world and into hedge funding. So talk to us about your evolution from East Chester to fashion and to hedge funding. Well, the evolution was planned probably since I was 10. So you knew it? I knew it. I knew that there was a better way. Um, I always affiliated with more wealthy people from East Chester, New Rochelle, Scarsdale, and said that anything they could do, I could do better. So you knew that at 10 years old? Maybe, yeah, ten between 10 wow. and 12. I just wow. knew that um, I could make it happen regardless of what industry if, that I would want to be in. And, and I've evolved from one industry to another. And Quite frankly, this is probably not my last, you know, maybe the last one is m movies. And if I want to do... You have a Hollywood face. Yeah, if I want to do movies, I'm going gonna, I'm so gonna to do oh, movies. Oh, I completely forgot. So for those of you who don't know, we usually play it. If you're going up to, you're at bat and baseball, I play like a, a walk-up song. So sure. I have a song for you that I thought about. I actually posted on Instagram. I didn't tag you in because I didn't want you to know the song. You know the song? Is it 90s? No, it's LMFAO. It's called I'm Sexy and I Know. Oh, I'm so Sexy and I You posted a picture, <laughs> tan, perfect everything smile, with no shirt on, and I'm sitting in a suit and tie pissed off. And this is the song that reminded me of you. So that's your intro song. Thanks for that. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, at a, at a very young age, um, the one thing I wouldn't accept, I didn't, I didn't have a father. Um... I had one in the city, but... He uh, wasn't present. He wasn't present and died young from whatever, partying. And um, Do you think that impacted you throughout the rest of your life? Of course. Yeah, that's why I always kept partying at, 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 I would say, the bare minimum. I was much more into health, sports. And, um, you know, I, I, I grew up with a very strong mother. Who, she was your rock. She was my rock. I had two sisters that were rock, so I... I uh, I've always appreciated women because, you know, my, between my grandmother, my mother, and my two sisters, I grew up with in that environment where they were solid, you know, and I never had a solid male figure. So when I had my own children, the one thing I said I'm going to do for sure 
is I'm going to be solid regardless of the aggravation. I'm never going to waver. Um, you can appreciate that because I see Literally. the way you are with your son. Yeah. Or, uh, my, you know, my quasi, my quasi grandson. Yeah. Um, I'm old enough. It could be. It could be. Club. Not quasi, real. And um, so uh, for me, no one was going to put a boundary on me. I, I I didn't even feel I had to be, I didn't even feel like I had to be as well educated. I, I, I poo pooed school a little bit. Um, I ended up, of course, graduating high school and going to a design school in the city, to FIT, which I loved. Um, you just love that there were so many women there. You were the only, I was the only straight guy. Only straight guy in the school. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> it was fun. <laughs> Never lacking for dates. Oz, right? <laughs> and I had a business at the time back in Westchester, which was generating a lot of cash. So I also had a lot of what cash. What were you doing? What was that business? So I had one of the first detail. I went to California. I saw detailing. I said, I'm opening a detail. My mother said, you don't know anything about it. I said, uh, the first 20 or 30 cars I'll do myself. After that, I hired two guys. So learn it first and then hire somebody. Yeah, then I hired two guys. I took them out of the Chevrolet dealership, and we were doing uh, probably like 40 to 50 cars a week. Wow. So back then you were crushing it. Crushing it. Crushing it. All cash, stuff. All cash. First, it's first, about the cash? first cut. Nah, I spent it. <laughs> I spent uh, it. On the girls at FIT. <laughs> oh, gotcha. Right. That's actually not true. Um, okay. It's a great story. It's quick. Most of the money I actually saved mm -hmm. um, paid for my own college. And the leftover money, which was pretty good. So I went to uh, the Castaways boat, uh, Castaways Marina in New Rochelle. And there was this guy, Max Levine, and he had a big houseboat. And he always had great looking girls. He was an older guy, but he always had great looking girls. And I said, Max, you know, I got, I got, I got a, I, what's the secret? And he goes, well, I'm a good investor. I said, oh, okay, so talk to me. He goes, well, how much money do you have? So I said, I have about 40,000. 40,000, you, you come from a single mom. I go, that's what I, I worked. So he goes, all right, buy gold. So I went and bought gold and you know, right around the mid 70s gold quadruple. Sure. So I did very well. That was your first trade? That was my first trade. Went to Merrill Lynch, she opened up. As a matter of fact, the guy that I opened up with, he's probably about 78 now he's was still actually Merrill <laughs> he's no it was Merrill yeah. yeah and he's he's right across the street from me now in Greenwich he's wow, never he never retired so then um, as you know in that time when uh, New York was going bankrupt there was a uh, Abe Beam was the mayor little, little short guy um, <laughs> probably he came up with these bonds because you could you know now not like today where the government bails everybody out. Right. There was no bailouts. Right. The federal government said, we're not bailing you out. So he created Big Mac bonds, which I'm sure you're a little bit too young. You educated on them. So the Big Mac bonds paid me 19% triple tax rate. So now the money I had made in gold, I'm getting this gigantic. So, so I'm really rolling. And I bought a, a little penthouse apartment. In uh, Manhattan? No, I bought it in Bronxville. Oh, wow. So, I was actually living part of the time with a girlfriend in Manhattan, but anyway, long story short, that was the first. You made her pay the high end rent. Of course, <laughs> and I had the place sitting, sitting up in fashion. Yeah, this was it. Um, it was my first realization that, regardless of what you're trained for, you can do a lot of different things in life. And as I said earlier, that no one was ever going to tell me um, how to do it, what to do. Uh, I've, I, I never had a boss. I think I had a boss, I think my first job after I graduated college, um, for I think, I think I was two years, and he was a great guy. And ever since then, I've always opened a business, opened it, sold it, opened it, operated it, um, traded. Um, and then when I was about 42, 44, I really got tired of the fashion world. I think that's a young guy's At business. 42. Yeah, I got tired were of it. Were you burnt out or were you just tired of it? No, not burnt out. I was just like kind of bored. It was like, I do the same thing. You accomplished it. Yeah, I accomplished it. I did it. I sold the company um, and I decided that I was going to, you know, all my friends in Greenwich all worked for hedge funds. And I said, well, I'm going to go, I'm going to open my own hedge fund. So I went to a guy who gave me a shot uh, for two years with a contract. He said, you know, if the funds are all up, you, you know, get a bonus and blah, blah, blah. Did a lot of studying, a lot, you know, 
spoke to everybody, did the research, traded my own account, all different types of trades. Uh, so I took his four, he had four different funds, they were all pretty much lousy performance, and two years later, uh, they were all in the you know high teens, and so I'd accomplished it. So then I went out and opened with a partner, Tradex. And, At uh, what age is this now, it's 44, 45? No, the, yeah, this is, yeah, yeah, 40, I think it was maybe, I, I think it was like 47 actually. Um, so I opened up Tradex with a with a with a with a gentleman who was one of the top currency traders in the world. And you had met him how? Through tennis, playing tennis, and he was a great tennis. He was an ex hockey player. Um, I always equate, as you do, I always like. I think athletes are the some of the best investors. Because of the mentality. And competitive, and don't like to lose. And and quite frankly, like us, we're not that risk. You know, right. we're risk adverse. Right. So. So I met this gentleman, we opened it up, and um, we had a great run for like about, you know, like 12 or 14 years, made it through the financial crisis, um, and I still have a small book that I trade, and basically about eight years ago, got into hard money. Investing in hard money. Investing, you know, with John, mm -hmm. um, with John Laterra, JCL. And I would just do one-off deals with him, and I was fascinated. Did you pick and choose those one-off deals, or did you just say, hey, I like this, or I trust you, here's my money blind? I looked at every deal. Every deal. I, I didn't always go to the properties, right. but I looked at every deal. I saw what the borrower was up to. I saw the LTV on it. I looked at the neighborhood where the loan was. I did a cursory, I would say, compared to what we would do now. Sure. And these were smaller deals, right. so these were mostly... Fix and flips, yeah. and before fix and flips yeah, were even popular. Before it got saturated. Yeah, yeah. Now, here's a question that it's by twofold. Did you do your homework on the deal, right, before you contributed your own capital to lending on it, right? You invested into the hard money loan from an educational standpoint or a risk standpoint, meaning because you were fully interested in the actual lending space or you wanted to educate yourself on what hard money was and why someone would borrow at a rate higher than normal? I would say both. I was very interested why somebody would borrow at, you know, 12, back sure. then, 12 14, or 14%. 16, yeah. um, but I did my due diligence because when you start out from very humble beginnings, the fear of losing, hmm. I would think that I'm going to go back and, and, and be a poor kid again. Is that how you treat every trade, the fear of losing? Pretty much. But you don't. I know you. I know you don't operate out of fear. But it sounds like you. No, do. I'm not afraid. I'm afraid. The, the fear is losing, and then losing your status as what people in my firm come to know me as. He's a he's a solid trader. He's a go to guy. He he he, he makes money. And, and by the way, that doesn't mean every trade Correct. makes money. Overall. But Overall, no, absolutely you not. You don't judge a batting average by a game. By no, time. but I mean, if you, uh, let's say you're, in a, as a trader, let's say you're 60% of the time right. Mm -hmm. As long as you manage your losses on the other, and you're right 60% of the time, you make a fortune. So I, I manage my losses. So, you know, I would say I lose a trade, you know, make it simple. I might lose a quarter of a percent, and on my winners, I'm gaining six to eight percent. So you could lose really five times a quarter, but the one trade that makes up for it doesn't matter. Wow. And so my bat, you know, my batting average is pretty high. Eighty percent. And my money management is even, I think, even better. Well, I know you'd be very disciplined. You're very structured in that sense, right? What do you attribute that discipline to? I again, I think it's for, of fear of potentially screwing up and going back to. Uh, you know, those humble beginnings, right. which, by the way, the best memories of my life. Best school, yeah, best school ever. Best, best school ever, best friends, loved it. it blue, you know, maybe blue collar is not the right word, but like, you know, it, yeah. certainly not an affluent neighborhood, sure. uh, although that area yeah, now middle is... Middle class today, if you will. Today, t today might even be, you know, upper. But when I was there, it was, it was basically East Chester was the Bronx, um, sure. just in, in Westchester. So, 
you told me a story that you were like 150 pounds soaking wet, maybe playing middle linebacker in high school, and you mm-hmm. would just you actually had to stop playing because of concussions. Yep. Walk me through the mentality of that, and how you still have that same mentality. So I had a coach I never forget. His name was Ray Karowski. Came from Penn State. Um, maybe it didn't. I don't even know why he went from a Penn State. Right. I think he was an assistant, but anyway, he was a Penn State guy, rough and tough, and no bullshit. No bullshit. And so, you know, I went and tried out and made the, first I made the JV team, uh, the um, freshman team. Uh, and they kept saying to me, you know, you play, you know, free safety, you know, you're light. And, I, and I'd be like, coach, I, I like to hit. I, I need to let my anger out. I got to hit. So by the time I was in JV, I was playing a middle linebacker, maybe 150, maybe with equipment on, maybe I was 100. Maybe, so I, maybe, I, maybe, I, maybe I topped 160. Yeah. Um, led the team in tackles. Uh, unfortunately, um, the following year was probably my fourth or fifth concussion. And we were, I was lucky because we had a nurse at our school that recognized the symptoms. Because back then, nobody thought yeah, about right, it. Yeah, whatever. Lights out. Uh, all I wanted was Pac-Mans on my, on my helmet. You That's know, it. Like, yeah, just tackle, true. tackle, yeah. tackle. And because I was little, I used to let the guys kind of run over me. But then... Not get out of your grasp. Never got out of my grasp. So I would take a lot of hits. So they basically came and said, we, we've got you know bad news. And I said, what's the matter? And they said, you're, you're, you're off the football team. So I went and played tennis and became a, an avid tennis player, which has served me well in my Still adult life. Play. Yeah, I play three or four times a week. It's competitive. And um, you don't get any concussions. So what would, you, what would you say was the defining moment in your career that really took you from being with the masses, right? And put you on that all-star level. Now, you might not consider yourself an all-star. Somebody, you're somebody I consider an all-star from a people person and a business perspective. But have you been able to maintain that all-star status for so long in an industry that really does not have that great of a reputation? And a lot of guys did get wiped out from you know, buying the yachts, cars, girls, 10 penthouses. How have you been able to maintain that? Well, first of all, I keep my spending at a minimum. I'm not a, you know, the years that I have had great years and the years that I've had mediocre years, you would never right. know the difference. Yeah. I don't buy Lamborghinis. Um, I'm risk adverse, so I think that in a market where in the financial crash, I know one of our, our biggest fund, which was a, a currency fund, we were up about eight or nine percent. And everyone else was down, what, Every, 40? Yeah, down 40. Um, I did have another fund that was highly levered because that's what investors wanted, and that one did get dinged. Um, but I think the reason, quite frankly, I don't think it has anything to do with the success. I think it has to do with people's perception. I think when people meet me, there's a trust level that they have um, that I will do well by them, and, 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 and I'm very calm about it. I, I very rarely get rattled. and I think a very good demeanor. It's a good demeanor for, for this industry. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, maybe as a younger guy, I was a, maybe a little bit more of a yeller and a screamer sometimes. You, you, you were never a hothead, though, No, right? no, no. In the fashion business, hotheads, right. it didn't, yeah. it, it wouldn't work. The women were. Yeah, it was all the, <laughs> yeah. and it was mainly women. Yeah. So, you know, I went from a school that was all women. I went from a household that was all women. I went to an industry that trained. was all women. I, <laughs> so you really, yeah. you had to be, you had to behave yourself. You know, right. you, had to beha- you had to behave yourself. Sure. But, um... I think that, like, I don't know if there's one defining moment, but it it, it hit me at some level when I started to be successful in trading and and managing hedge funds and making investment in hedge funds and private equity businesses that, you know what? Wow, I can really do anything. And then all of a sudden I became, I think, I I, I didn't have the anxiety anymore. I I didn't have the, the fear of, well, if this doesn't work, then I'm, then it's a, it's all over. Because you believed in yourself, I or believe, you already proved yourself. Believe, well, I proved myself number one, but I believed in myself that even if the current situation was to, um, you know, implode with the world, I, I would find a way to reinvent myself, and it could be in a totally different industry. And believe me, when people said you're going from the fashion business to the hedge fund business, Idiot, they doing? laughed. Yeah, sure. No, they laughed. Yeah. Um, you know style, and now you're going to go into this. Yeah, what if, well, you know what you know? What do you know? And I was learning curve. 
It was, was it was steep. You know, I would say, uh, you know, to get really comfortable, like I worked for somebody, and the and the and the gentleman was really great to give me a great break. Uh, but every month that we put up the numbers um, in those funds that I was co co chief investment officer because he was the chief investment officer because he owned the company. Perfect. Whatever. And that doesn't um, matter. Six months later, I didn't let him make a trade. Six months later, I, I did not. You know, I basically told him, "You yeah, can't. Let me off the leash. You can't even come in my office." <laughs> and and he said, "Okay, as long as you're doing well." And, and it, that was a defining moment. I think that I knew that I could do it. And if it wasn't in that industry, I could make it in another industry, and that made me, as a person, feel really good. Now, we've had multiple conversations of, you know, the 2007 and 8 collapse, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's when I invented myself, mm -hmm. right? You could say reinvented, but invented myself as an adult, if you will, when I was still a kid, 20 years old. And your trade and your foresight on the soon to be collapsing market. You told me a story one time that you realized when your mailman that was making whatever, 40, 50, whatever he was making, $50,000 mm -hmm. a year, showed up driving, I believe it was a BMW or a Mercedes. Two, he had two BMWs. His and hers. Yeah. So he, he had one and his wife. What was the, tell the actual story. So I started to see everybody cash out, doing cash out refis to create a lifestyle. But it was never created, it was a house of cards because they were only creating it because the, they happened to be lucky that the value of their house went up. That was one thing. And I, and I kept thinking about it. And I was thinking about it for a year. And I said, something has to go. Prices can't go like this. But what I really saw was the hockey stick between the house price appreciation and, and your income. So for 30 years, Income would go up. Your income would Stagnant. go up three or four percent. Right? Whatever. Back then, it was a little higher yeah. than it is today, and your house would go up three percent. So, so it was healthy. It was healthy. So now, all of a sudden, it's a hockey stick. So your your house is going up fifteen percent, twenty percent a year, and your income is not. Right. That's when I knew that it was a house of cards. And so we did a lot of research, and we found you know the right. I would call them jockeys. We did not actually make those trades. We allocated our capital to two firms um, that were putting that trade on specifically. And what trade was this? Shorting subprime bonds. So the big short. So it was the big short. We were involved with the same guys that are in the movies and um, another great investor, you know, over at Paulson. Um, and we, we just, we knew it, and you know the bonds were trading at 103, and you know bond math. I mean, where can the bond go? Can it, it could go to 105, right. but but a bond doesn't go 200. It, no, I mean that, it, that's yeah. it. Yeah. You know, that, that's where it is. Yeah. So I figured we could lose. You know, with with these were highly levered, and you know with all that we could probably lose. I told everyone coming in. I said you could lose probably seven to ten percent before you're going to make you know three or four or five times your money. And basically, that's what happened. So you could lose ten percent, but the upside's three hundred percent. Exactly. It was more Thanks. like it was more like five hundred percent. Who knew? Who knew? And even even my own partners, once the money doubled, they got very excited and said, "We've had enough." Yeah, we're out. I've said, no, "Go back, out. go back, and trade your currencies," because uh, they like liquidity. I said, "This is just beginning. This is maybe when the bonds had gone from one hundred three to, I forget the number, but you know, maybe it was at seventy. And then with the leverage included, you'd have doubled your money. Sure. And so we basically ended up covering, and I say we, we did not, we, you know, we were monitoring. You made the investment. Yeah, we were monitoring the guys. And those bonds, they actually ended up covering probably at around eight, seven or eight, but seven or eight cents. So with so leverage. So every dollar you put in, you, you made got back five. Five. Yeah. In, in what time frame? That was about uh, a little less than two years. Wow. So long-term capital Five times gains. Your money in two years. Yeah. And then you call that your retirement trade, right? That was the retirement trade. Well, that, I mean, that gave, me a, that gave me enough of a cushion of to be able to do other things. But I didn't do other things. Because then that really, that really gave me the addiction sure. for, the next big, for the next big trade. I mean, we rode the China. Um, you know, we rode the China. We were making, you know, 80, 90% a year for two or three years in wow. a row when China was ex sure. exploding in 2005 and 2006. So for me, instead of being a trader 
only, and I do trade every morning. I, tr I trade a book. I trade you know derivatives. I trade uh, gold. I trade commodities. All for, what's your average dollar? People like to hear like real facts, right? What's your average dollar amount trade that you do today on average? Is it a million bucks? Oh, million? it's hard. That's hard. I mean, ballpark. It's you know it could be anywhere from a hundred thousand to you know five million. So do you? So just again from a strategy standpoint, so mm -hmm. people are listening. Everyone wants to be a trader, right? They think it's easy money. Everyone wants to call the next, you know, stock that's going to go big time, and they don't trade stocks necessarily in particular. They're more indexes and funds, I believe. Do you? Okay, you have a hundred thousand dollars for a trade. Do you make that your entry point, and with the expectation to having to go in if it drops in dollar cost average, or do you? Go in with all that money you have, and it either works out or it doesn't. Well, my trading style is I don't chase a bad yeah. trade. If right. if I put on, you know, uh, let's say the the equivalent of let's say it's a hundred thousand in margin, mm -hmm. and that gives me let's say a two million, three million dollar trade, um, and I'm and I'm thinking gold's going to twelve sixty, which sure. I, I think it's going. It's a it's a twelve eighteen. We you know we gold got was at fourteen hundred. I thought fourteen hundred fourteen twenty five fourteen twenty five. Right. Um, what did I, did I say? So? Oh, okay. Sorry. Fourteen twenty-five. <laughs> but at thirteen, at thirteen eighty, yeah. I got long a lot of gold. I think it's going back to nineteen. I, I knew it was thirteen sixty. So my downside, if I'm wrong, technically was you know twenty, you know twenty bucks. But my upside is could be it could be 30%. it could be going back. No, it could be going yeah. back to nineteen. Yeah, I think it goes back to nineteen hundred. I'm. It is going to go back yeah. to nineteen hundred. I don't know if it's. Well, I don't yeah. know if it's a straight line. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but. But, but trading for me now is looking for the one to two trades that I think are going to be, that we're never probably going to get another subprime where you make that kind of money. Right. Because that was, 500%. that was an anomaly. But we could see the equity market. I'm, I'm a big believer that the equity market has been built on borrowed money mm -hmm. for Love share that. buybacks and dividends. So it's not based on it's not based on fundamentals, which I don't really even believe in all that. I'm much more technically driven and macro driven. And everything else is built on hype right now. Well, I a mean, lot. listen, the equity market here up here at three the S and P is the only thing I look at is you know let's say at three thousand, it it's it's trading a little rich to its historical value, but it's not crazy rich. What bothers me is how it got there. How quickly? It's. Well, it's it's take, I mean it's this this is a ten year this is a ten did year. Did you see ten years ago? Did you ever think you'd see the S and P hit three thousand? Truthfully. Yeah, I thought when we came out of the crisis that we that we probably would hit three thousand. Yeah. Wow. As a matter of fact, I have a target. Um, I have a target of about thirty three hundred. So. You know, How does that move north? I think I, not necessarily, not but I up. think the upside from the market here is about ten percent. Hmm. So. But would you want to, if you had gotten all these beautiful gains, if you had made, if you had just invested in the S&P and you had made three to four times your money since wow. the crash, wow. why would you want to risk? Be greedy for 10%. My grandfather said, don't stand in front of a steamroller mm -hmm. for a quarter. Right. If you want to stand there, that's fine. Quarter but you got to, you got to, you got to be, you got to be, right. get, you got to be getting paid. Um, so yeah, I'm very, uh, you know, I tell people that know nothing about finance. You know, they say, well, what should I do with my 401k? I'm saying, look how much money you made. Go conservative. Take everything in cash and maybe buy some calls on S&P so that if it goes up, you make a little bit of more money Something. on the way up. But you know what? Be in cash, I think, currently is, not a, is really not a bad idea. So what advice would you have for somebody that wants to get into the hedge fund space, right? Now, there's multiple hats you can wear inside the hedge fund sure. space. So someone that just graduates college, what do you tell them to do? Well, right now, the hedge fund space, I mean, to be honest, the hedge fund space for the last seven or eight years has been horrible because, remember, you're hedging. Right. So the passive investments have made all the money. The guy that's the fund, the vanguards, they're, well, they're 100% long, right? So they are the ones, quite, yeah. quite frankly, that have made the money. Now, if you had had shorts on during that whole time frame, you lost on every single Everything. one because the whole entire market was driven up. And quite frankly, it's still really going that way today. But I think, like I said, I think we're very close 
to the so end. It's funny, right? So, you know, listen, when you're a kid, you, know, you got a couple of dollars, you invest whatever, two, three hundred in a stock. You know, I tell everyone, I tell these people flat out, I'm like, well, in 2006, I bought Apple at 47 a share, whatever it was, and I sold mm-hmm. it at 72. Why? Because I had four shares of it. I needed drinking money to go to the bar, right? It's the summertime. I had the money, right? So I sold out at 72. Then I got in in 07. Right when I in 08, really, when I, I think I made like nine, ten grand, whatever it was, and plus or minus a thousand here or there. It's the point of it. So I bought Citibank at a dollar. Mm-hmm. Right, I put I think I put like forty thousand into it, whatever it was, with two dollars. I'm like, oh fuck! I'm like, I just doubled the money. Imagine if I've been sitting on it today. Right, took it out, put it back in the business. I needed the money to live, so I was basically taking my commission checks. Where's Citibank today? I don't even know, but a lot more than a dollar. Well, I, I think J.P. Morgan was under $10. I think 18 16 it, and, it, and it trades at 112 115 that, right. yeah. So, you know, Fannie Mae, two, three cents. You know, today's at two fifty five, right? And I had tens of thousands of shares. I own it. You still own Fannie Mae. Yeah. So, yeah, I think I bought it at like two, three cents, sold it at five and six. But again, back then, you know, I was playing with money that I needed to survive, right? So I wasn't actually doing the trade. I was getting my double the money in and out. Facebook bought 17, like sold it 21, 22, whatever. You know, it's 200 today. Well, there's something to be said about buying some of these for the long term. So, but again, so because I was young, right, mm-hmm. and I needed my money to, I mean, listen, when I was 22 years old, my Amex bill monthly was 10,000 because I had lunches, dinners, you know, I was living that lifestyle where, hey, I'm not cooking, I'm buying breakfast with a referral, potential referral source, mm-hmm. lunch with a, you know, you do. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner five times, fifteen times. You do the math. You know, fifty dollars. Whatever. You were networking. It adds up quickly, and that's where my money got reinvested back into my business. Right. Um, what advice would you have for that person that wants to start trading, mm-hmm. right, and saying, "Hey, buy one share of Facebook, hold that, but trade five shares of Facebook." For an example, like, I know you want to trade, but it's sometimes better to just hold. There's a famous investor, uh, Jack Schrager. And if you read his book, the first thing he'll always say is, find a trading style that fits your personality. Hmm. Some guys, a lot of guys in my office, they take a lot of risk during the day, but that's it. Positions are all closed out at 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock, whenever. They very rarely, so they're really looking for short-term moves. Hit and run? Yeah, look, like how much did I make today? Yeah. You know, I, I, I made 50 grand or I lost 12 grand, you know, some, something in, in, in that neighborhood. There are other guys that have a longer term view. Um, I've come to conclude that I feel certain days there's both. So I have a long position on gold that I'm not going to take off. No matter what. No matter what. I've got a long position on silver. I've got a, f- I don't buy a lot of single equities, but I have a few. Single equities that have a very strong binary event coming in the next six months to a year. So if I'm right, they're going to be. It's going to be like a free option. But what I've, as I've gotten a little bit older, what I've realized is there's a lot of just noise in the market during the days. All it is is noise. Nothing is changing. It's just yeah. It's that's it's you know Trump tweets hmm. and. You know, gold moves. You know, the bonds move. You know, I'm 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 more macro. Like I said, I'm not really individuals individual stocks. So, what I've been doing lately is trying to find trades that are like pivoting, that have come to a certain level that we determine through all sorts of mathematical equation Fibonacci's. Um, there's a lot of stuff that we really wouldn't have time or. Most people wouldn't understand, but mathematically, we see where these positions are at levels where they should probably reverse themselves, or they hit levels where they should basically go higher from a certain level. And with you, when you find those and you and you hone your expertise, you can hold trades for a long time. And then when I looked back, I said, "Well, the best trades I ever made were the ones that I held." for a year or two. My gold trade, when I was a baby. Sure. You know, my subprime. Um, set it and forget it? Almost set it and forget it. Well, I mean, a couple, it was two years. Of course, of course. And, and, and you really couldn't trade. Two years I mean, a long time today. To be fair, you really couldn't right. trade in and out of it anyway. Sure. I mean, you could have just got out of it right. totally. Um, so I think for a young person today, um, I think it's more difficult. When I grew, when I started coming up, there was no AI. There was no artificial intelligence. 
Now there's robots yeah, that trade. Research that you're doing. Yeah, so when you know when there's an announcement from the Fed that the supercomputer AI, as soon as they hear the first, let's say the first letter of the word, sure. the computer knows what it's going to say. Bingo. So they're they're seconds faster than everybody, and seconds in this industry. Exactly. If you're trading a new, the news yeah. is is monumental. So I think it's harder, and I think the young guys today have to learn how to trade against the robots. The robots tend to trade in and out, mean reversion, and, and do a lot of trades during the day. Um, so I think the longer term strategy, by doing a lot of work on a taking a view on a, either a specific currency pair, a view on gold, a view on the equity market, and doing it in futures and being able to hold it is my advice. Don't get pushed out because you use too much leverage. Right. So go in smaller yep. and be able to stay. So if you have 20 contracts right. and it moves four points, you're out. But right. if you have 10 contracts and it moves four points, it's still a little painful, but you're not gonna get a margin call. That's leverage is the killer for most. Young guys blow up two or three accounts before they finally I'm get sure. it right. They all learn. They all so, learn. you know what the most, I would say, out of everything I've been through in life, everything, including my... Broken ankle? Broken ankle. <laughs> you know, that was probably, that was the most pivotal experience in my life, right? That was the breaking point, if you will, right? That put me on the right path and direction, even though it sucked and was painful and a lot of bad stuff happened, ancillary to just, ankle didn't just break everything else broke around it. But I reinvented myself again from there. I'm still reinventing myself from it. Um, and I learned a lot from it. Blessing in disguise. Probably the most painful thing that I experienced was when it had to be 2011, 2012. You know, I was sitting on a good chunk of money, cash. I, I'm not a cash guy. Mm -hmm. I've always like, hey, listen, if I have 10, 20 grand, like it's going into this business, it's going into this idea, this a deal. website. Yeah, because listen, you're in your 20s, take those risks, you know? Hey, you need 50000 for your bar? Here. You need 40000 for your business? Good. You know, whatever it was, right? Friends, family, you name it. Help, help, help a lot of people out. The most painful thing I think I experienced was, you know, when I was watching banks, mortgage banks that I was working for, taking multi-million dollar losses and buybacks to FHA, mortgage mm -hmm. insurance companies were bankrupt, so they were basically not insuring against the losses when they should have been, right? Mm -hmm. The actual small mortgage bank owner was closing their doors left and right, the ones I always worked for. Not gonna lie, I've never been at a mortgage bank that ever closed its doors, believe it or not. But some of the owners, it's pretty impressive that they're still around, right? Some were great guys. Um, I was watching them take millions and millions and millions of dollars of losses. And I said, well, if this small bank that does $300 million a year, for example, just got a bill from FHA for four or five million, right? Mm -hmm. They should be going under. Imagine with these big banks, Bank of America, Chase, Wells Fargo, all these big banks that government acquired mergers with Washington Mutual and all the other bullshit banks back in the day, rather than them going out, they merged with a bigger conglomerate for cash deposits. You know more about that than I do from a liquidity Well, standpoint. I think Bank America was forced by Country the government yeah. to buy Countrywide. They, were, no, they, they didn't buy them, they and were then, giving them. And, they said, and then they had to absorb all the, all the, all the penalties so, and the fines. So there was a triple leveraged stock, mm -hmm. FAZ. Mm -hmm. It shorted the financial sector, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm like, Okay, well, I know all these banks just got crushed, right? Their stock prices really should be lower than what they are. I'm watching small companies lose three to five million dollars a day. They were getting bills for. I'm putting fifty thousand into triple shorting the financial sector, and it tripled. I'm like, wait, what? I know this is bullshit. Like, I'm watching these banks take multi-million dollar losses, and this. Financial sector is going up two, three times. I don't understand that, but I know I'm right. So I had the right trade, the right mentality, the statistics to back it up, and I lost 50 grand in a day. On a that day. trade. Literally, because it's a triple leverage. It was you know. three times leverage. Yep. And it was down 15 or, you know. In a day. Like, literally was so like, now you're 45, 50 I was done. It's literally right. in a second. And the way it compounds, 15% like yeah. isn't really 15%, yeah. you know? You never buy levered ETFs. I learned that. Unless that's you true. trade them just for a day or two. Right. So I learned that right. at 24. That's, that's, a, that's a hard loss for me. Yeah. And here's the reason it's why. big money. I was right. Well, forget the money. Yes, the mo I'm not money. You know I mean? I'm not, right. Like money comes and goes. Right. Is what it is. I respect it. But it was but a, it was the right trade. I was right. I'm like, listen, here's the facts. Like. Right. These banks have to be losing trillions of dollars, right? I'm a little guy here in the Bronx doing $30 million a year in business, and look what these banks are losing 
talk to me about that. So how did banks lose so much money, but their stock prices went up 10 times? How does that happen? Well, I mean, I don't know what period of time you're talking about. Citibank, yes, I remember when it traded at a dollar and Prince said, if the music is playing, we're going to keep dancing. Yep. Yep. Um, but I think it took years for it to get to the multiple that you're talking about. Right, so what I came to learn was the banks were taking on the bad debt and they were taking the servicing to the bad loans and basically writing it off of their books. So like Bank of America, for example, took on, let's just say they had two trillion in bad loans, mm -hmm. they would just say, hey, company, Bank of America Holdings, bad fund, here, and this is now your asset, and they took the liabilities and defaults off their books. Well, and that's they all did that. They had a good bank and a bad bank. Right, how bad is that though, from, a, from an ethical standpoint, right? Well, that's why they paid. That's why the fines were as big as they were. And it, t it took Bank of America, you know, um, what's the guy's name? That's uh, they got Merrill Lynch involved. Brian and the capital. Moynihan, wasn't is it? Is Probably, it, I think so. That bank, I mean, we just watched it every single quarter. Another billion, another two billion sure. in fines. I mean, they really they basically... They reimburse me my 50K, right? Put a, put a claim in. Right, seriously. No, you're the little guy. Yeah. They don't care yeah, about you. Not. They don't care about it. And, you know, the, you know, something to be said about the subprime that I think is worth mentioning. I think people are misguided and they think that, um, you know, there was some scam by the banks and this and that. No, not, not really. I, I, I put the blame on the, the guys like the Barney Franks of the world because if you wanted a banking license in St. Louis, you had to open up branches in the inner city and you had to make subprime loans sure. so in the urban areas so home ownership went from us there's only about 65 percent of the population in the united states that is responsible enough 65 percent yeah about 65 maybe i'm off by a point maybe it's 64 that's this is historically that is responsible enough to have a mortgage wow. and to keep a job and pay for it so a third of homeowners well they in. got they got the home ownership up to 70. So if you look at that, the default it's rate. It's not that big, actually. No, the, the, an well, the default, no, but that was the whole amount that defaulted. Wow. So basically, you could have probably, you could have avoided most of that calamity sure. had you not forced a mortgage on someone that doesn't, really isn't responsible. They have they're, they're not responsible so enough. You're saying only like 10% increase in home ownership caused, to that, essentially, caused. Home ownership, but the majority oh. of it being subprime. That's crazy. So all of a sudden they added in sure. all of these, you know, 600, 550 FICOs right. and they let them go with no doc, low doc, yeah. liar no, loans, no, no, no. whatever. They, yeah. they, you, you got a loan. Um, yeah, and so it, it, it's now why the default's so low is because they found the right amount of the population that was actual re, actually responsible enough wow. to have a mortgage, keep their job, pay the mortgage, and not default. Mm -hmm. So it's... I, I, I think it could have been avoided, and I think a lot of this was driven by the politicians. Hmm. So going down a different route, which I know people want to hear about, I say, like, you know, you're the exception to the rule in the hard money space. Like, you brought professionalism with a business background and integrity into a space that, for lack of a better term, term had none. I mean... What's been your experience so far? And tell me some funny stories. Shocking. That, shocking, right? It's <laughs> shocking. amazing that these people make this kind of money. Shocking. What's been your experience so far? And have you thought about getting out of it because of how no. painful it is? You know, I love the hard money because every deal is a story. And I've never really been in a business. A trade is a trade. If I'm trading gold, it's very finite. It's either going up or it's going down. But with a hard money loan, you can be creative in your structuring, and you know this. Um, Not in a living. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can be creative to kind of make it work, you know, retrofit it, if you want to say. Now, sometimes I find that a little Too much story. slimy, and, yeah. a, and I don't want to know all this. I don't want to know all this. But quite frankly, That's why brokers. <laughs> yeah. That, well, and 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 you know, listen, we we have we we have a lot of real. I think we have really a lot. We've met a lot of good brokers along the way, in, in, you included. Um, if so you the, make it better, so you know. We try, you know. You and, not your company, you personally. Because I took a vested interest and said, here's a guy that can really generate a lot of business. Let's find out what works for us, not just for me and not just for you. Let's find out 
a trading, if you want to call it, style that works for Jeff Van Note and for Michael Beatty from Tradex Realty so that we can maximize our relationship and do as many loans. Sure. It, it really bothers me when you come with a loan that I can't fund. Right. So I'm going to try to find a way. And, you know, I think that other brokers that we've met along the way, they're just, um, I don't I, I can't explain it, and I don't want to put anybody down. I just think they're not sophisticated enough, but they've survived in this business by matching A with B. Yep. Um, you know, we you know we have a couple of different venues in hard money, but the majority of our loans are retained. We keep them. So for us, finding the right brokers and structuring a deal that works for the borrower, I think we're doing the industry a big favor. Sure. Because we are keeping commerce going when the banks have said no. So do you, do you see that continuing? Do you see banks tightening up? I just read an article today. Actually, I'll give you an example. I didn't even read an article today. I lied. I saw a headline. Mm -hmm. Subsequently, you know, I still, you know, people still call me all the time for residential mortgages, right? Mm -hmm. So I refer them to the people that have always been there for me. Whether mm -hmm. it's New York, New Jersey. Listen, if you if you ever did anything for me, put like this, you didn't have to do anything for me. If you didn't try and hurt me throughout my career, mm -hmm. I'm gonna give you a loan. Mm -hmm. Because this is your business, it's not my business anymore. I'd rather have the relationship, maintain a relationship with the person coming to me and send them to somebody who usually more often than not gets the job done. So Client has a 622 credit score. They're literally going in for a clear to close. The bank pulls the credit report today when they had a DU, Fannie Mae approval. Mm -hmm. the credit score went to 638. So mm -hmm. the credit score went up, up. 16 points. Mm -hmm. DU, the Fannie Mae digital engine, denied the loan. The credit score, and that was submitted last month. So Fannie Mae, in the matter of from June to July, same exact parameters, credit score went up. Every, the loan was better from a credit standpoint today than it was last month. Changed the rules. Changed the rules. So if Fannie Mae is tightening up, you know they're getting heat from, I'm sure, all the big wigs. And obviously, you know, it's neither here nor there whether Fannie and Freddie are going to make it. But if they're tightening up, you got to think the hard money game is going to continue expanding. Well, I mean, the, there's a direct correlation between what we charge and, and the liquidity factor. So right now, direct. direct. So right now, because the liquidity is still flowing fairly abundantly, yeah. right? We, we, our loan, you know, our yield is really not what it always was. Historically, hard money was twelve to fourteen, minimum, yeah. and and two, and when things were tight, it would go to sixteen. Yep. Or 18. 16 and 18. I didn't see, I wasn't around for, for That's the 18, but, but John, yeah. you know, John had seen some yeah. of the 18. I mean, I think at the at the end of the day, the liquidity, even in the most liquid parts of the country where there's a multiple hard money lenders, I already start, I am starting to see it tighten. Once the banks tighten, they they're going to need the hard money lenders more than they're not, and our goal. They need them more. Oh, of course, because when you know when the banks say no to a commercial multi-use four fam yeah, with a with a bar, property, yeah, whatever. whatever the deal is, and the Story. bank the banks say no, absolutely not. So the banks over the last couple of years have been a little bit more accommodating. There's been a little bit more liquidity. That to me is probably in the late innings, and I think that hard money lending is going to be. Explosive in twenty. The right hard money lending. The right hard money lender and the right deals and the right guys structuring the deals. I don't mean guys coming for a seventy-five LTV. I'm talking about true bridge lending, where you're looking at a fifty to sixty LTV. You have an exit strategy, and the guy has had the guy has executed multiple deals in his past. So your execution, because that's the biggest thing. You have execution risk. If that borrower can't get completed and go back for traditional done. financing, then I, as the lender, how do I get my money back? Yeah. I could say, done. well, I'm collecting 2% a month in defaulted interest. Yeah, That's all great, but I may be sitting with the property. I don't want to, I'm not in the loan to own. I'm in the loan to recoup my principal yeah. back, get my interest, out. and give the guy another loan on his next project because he's a responsible sponsor. He's a responsible sponsor. So how much weight do you personally put on a credit score? In our firm, I would say, you know, if 10 being the most weight on a, on someone's credit score, I'd say we probably six or okay, a seven. Midway. 
Yeah, we, we really underwrite the asset. So if the asset is valuable, um, it's unencumbered, it's a first, you know, we have the first mortgage, um, we, we have a macro view, so if it's in the right area, if it's in a growing area, mm -hmm. and the LTV is good, quite frankly, if the, I mean, if listen, if the, if the sponsor, you know, has had three bankruptcies and, and, and a couple of foreclosures, even with that, we, we'd be hesitant. Right. We'd be hesitant. Right. Um, so the character, that's but the but if you know if 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 a sponsor or a borrower has a 600, 600 FICO, and we love the asset, we love the asset, and especially if it's cash flowing, because then if I take it back, it's cash flowing, it's paying for sure. itself. I don't have to put my money. I don't have to put any money out of my pocket. So those parameters, I would say that the credit score is uh, is probably not the most important. If I have a checklist of four things. Yeah, so it's, if it's not the least, it's the second from the least. So talk to me about all the cowboys in the business, the greedy guys that come in. They try to undercut people on rate, points, service. We all know most people's service sucks. Not They're looking for market. People. They want market. But how do you maintain true to your business model, even with trading and hedge fund, and even probably in the fashion game? Like You have a motto, which I've taken from you, I've borrowed, right, with no interest. Ignore the crowd. How have you been able to successfully ignore the crowd, stick to your guns and morals, and still be profitable and operate at you know a successful level? I think we we operate in a more professional, and we have a macro view, and we look at things. Most people have a macaroni view. <laughs> macro macaroni view. and cheese. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> we we really look at a loan almost to the level of you know. Okay, if this loan defaults, what's it going to cost me? How am I going to get out? And what's the time frame to get out? Um, what's the possibility of this loan defaulting? Is it, is it cash flowing? So all the things that we look at go back to what you just said, is discipline. We also don't take a lot of money from investors, and this is really key. If, if I was taking money hand and fist every month from investors that invest with sure, us, sure. I'd have to put that money to work or I dilute the return. So what I've been able to do is manage my deal flow to match the incoming capital. So, so you're taking on 10 million and saying, hey, we have to lend 10 million. You're keeping a healthy number. I'm taking in 2 million right. and I've got four deals that are 3 million so I have to rid myself of one of those deals anyway. And I, and I rid myself, it just forces me to keep the creme, de la, the creme de la creme and not chase the mediocre deals. Have you ever made a decision out of desperation before in your life? Personally or professionally? Hmm. That you regret? Yeah, I guess when I was 16 and I was misbehaving. <laughs> You've had that long of a track record not making a decision at desperation. I've made some wrong decisions. Uh, if I look back in... You can't let everyone know you're perfect, so I have to come back with something. You know? Well, I mean, I, I, I'll give an example. So, you know, we saw the 2006 when I said, this, this thing has got a... This is a house of cards. So I liquidated all my China... Uh, hedge funds. We had made probably 100 to 150% on all these hedge funds. And I allocated them to a trade that didn't involve stocks. So it was a lending business, okay? And I did 10 of them. And it worked because I stayed out of the market. The problem was the liquidity. Even though the asset I was I was lending, similar to hard money, I was lending on an entity, a business, a hard asset. The problem was, even though the value of the asset didn't go down, we couldn't move it. We couldn't sell it. So in so high, there, no buyers for it. there was no buyer. There's no buyer. So it was better than being in the market because in the market you were taking 10%, 15% hit every single quarter right. until, until we got to the bottom, sure. uh, which was in March of, oh, of 2009. Yeah. So... I think that decision was well thought out. So no, the answer is I've never made a decision out of desperation. And the wrong decisions, I go back and I reanalyze that decision that I'm talking about, and I say, but it was the right, it was the right move, but I never expected, I expected the stock market to crash. 
I expect that the subprime market to crash. We certainly capitalized big on that. I didn't expect the lack, the, the lack of liquidity to be as powerful as it was. So in hindsight, what I should have done is gone to cash and just said, you know it's coming, you see it. Don't get greedy. Don't try to pick another asset class that you believe will do better. Just take all trade off. Just table. take it all off. No exposure. So when people come to me today and I say, and they say my 401k is up like 400% hey. over over the last I go and I said this earlier in in our in our conversation I said take the money out. Either put it into a hard asset mm -hmm. or just sit in cash, make your 1%. Yeah, not making money better than and not, uh, losing pres money. Preservation of capital sure. is, is, is better than losing capital. So do that. Once the market corrects itself, you go back in and you start again. Now, that takes a lot of discipline, mm -hmm. and it takes a lot of thought. But say don't catch a falling knife, right? And how do you know when that falling knife is uh, I mean, for me, I would say, historically, at 30%, at a 30% hit to the, let's say, to the S&Ps. 2,100. Yeah. We we would like it to be fifteen hundred, right. you know, but you know it's going back. right. But I'd like it to be fifteen hundred. But okay, twenty one hundred is a, a level that actually on a on a Fibonacci is actually a a, a very possible level. At twenty one hundred, you go right. Okay, so you were a little bit early, and it goes from twenty one hundred, it goes to nineteen hundred. Right. Not the end of the world. Still you're still you're still going to go back to more likely than not, we'll see three thousand again. Um, but this is with everything. There's nothing wrong with going to cash. There's nothing wrong with booking your gains, sitting back and re and reevaluate. And it's the same with real estate. So you know the cowboys out there, you ask, giving these loans. I laugh. We lose deals to people that are doing eight percent, eight and a half percent. No money to be made. Hard money loan. Right. What? This, but worse, they're doing them at seventy five LTV. So 25 percent and <laughs> un, un, but once you hit right. over a 25 percent yeah. hiccup on that asset, it's now it's now yeah, hitting. We looked at last week; they were negative two million in equity. Remember? It's ridiculous. They wanted 11 million, and yes. we were like, "We can give you nine. Because they hear that it's available, yeah. so they come around. And they want 10 percent, no points. And we say, and we say, "Listen, thank you for you know, thank you for shop, you know, thank you sure. for showing us your deal." Sure. Um, we're only, I, and I'm probably of the uh, of the three of us. That may, that are on the investment committee, I'm probably the the most negative, and think every deal. I think every deal is bad, and that's how I go in. Now prove me wrong. That deal stinks. Tell me the story. Tell me the story. How, why am I wrong? Right. So in, in, there's other guys. They think they love every deal. They're deal junkies. I call them in this in the in the in bridge lending. They love a deal. They never met a deal they didn't Just like. Do deal to, to do the deal. I hate I hate every I hate every that's deal, possible. and I think that's what's going to keep us from, um, you know, I think that's what, when we say ignore the crowd, we are ignoring the mistakes that we see other lenders possibly make. That's just stupidity at one point. Yeah, I mean, I'm gonna be nice and say, because these are competitors and sometimes colleagues. Naive. Greedy. Desperate. Naive. Desperate. Interesting. Forced. Yeah. They have money. Forced. They have, they have investors. Well, I'll give you a funny story. So a guy uh, called me up in like 2017, and he's like, hey, listen, I just raised $10 million in capital. Uh, I'm sitting on too much of it. He's got a guy in deals for me, a guy in deals for me. I'm like, listen, this is before, right before you and I had actually met, funny mm -hmm. enough. And I'm like, um, yeah, I'm like, I got this shitty deal in Florida. It's like $85,000. The guy's buying it for 95000 He can't really get a conventional mortgage, whatever. He didn't have his fund season, whatever it was. He you know, has no mortgage contingency in the contract. I'm like... All right. Now listen again. From my experience in the business, there are some business decisions that could be made to the right people, right? Based on their track record. Okay, you own twenty properties. I'll give you a higher LTV. So I know you can get out, and I know you're a legitimate guy, or whatever the case. Or might you be. have something to yeah. cross them. There's with. a way to protect yourself. Correct. Right? So this guy literally gave my client eighty-five. I think it was eighty-two thousand mm -hmm. on a loan, right? For hard money, whatever it was ten and two, but it was a you know. 85 LTV, whatever it was. And he's like, oh, well, I have so much capital here. I just have to put something out. And then he ran out of capital. And I'm like, wow, that's quick. But I'm like, well, you know what? I'm like, did you do more risky deals like this? Like, you know, lucky I told you, hey, look, once we wait six months, property goes up, borrow will have more cash. We can definitely refinance you out based on today's current lending programs. But isn't that crazy? Like, hey, I'll do a deal. Just do a deal because I have to deploy capital. Yeah. I see it all the time. And, and, and it's in bigger... 
you know, remember the family offices, um, some of the pension funds. Sure. They're forcing, you know, the guys like even even the Blackstones of the world are, are doing these large, high, I'd say highly levered, but levered funds, you know, $500 million. I mean, so if you're sitting on $500 million, whatever the number may sure. be, you have to put it to work or sure. you're going to dilute. I think our strategy of touching each property that we invest with in, in the bridge lending, um, staying conservative, staying in areas that show robust yep. growth, yep. Um, not oversaturated, getting the right appraisal, what's it really worth, not an appraisal, inflated, you know, inflated at, you know, I used to say, would you get that out of a Cracker yeah, Jacks box? Not so low. Well. Yeah, I mean, or, you know, any any of the any of the any of those things I think will keep you out of trouble. Now, the market's made a lot of winners, right? Mm-hmm. It's gone straight up. Real estate, mm-hmm. stock market, S and P, everything Dow, right? mm-hmm. it's gone straight up. You know there's a correction coming. What is your thesis on the next twelve months, twenty four months, and how bad is it going to get in your opinion? We'll start with real estate. I mean, I'm a believer that we are just on the verge of finally, after printing money for 11 years, seeing some stable income growth, seeing wage, uh, seeing other inflation in um, in healthcare, in college, um, in food. Uh, so I'm a believer that we're on the tip of a possible big inflation. If that's the case, real estate is not going to not go down, but real estate, the value of your real estate, a hard asset when there's, you know, when we, let's say inflation rate goes to five and a half or six. Sure. It's been, it's barely been two. The okay. Fed wants two. It goes to two, it goes back to one, 160, it goes to two. But the bottom line is we haven't been in inflation for more than 10 years. If that's the case, I'm bullish on real estate. If that's not the case, and inflation goes back to one, I'm very negative on real estate and think that we will correct sometime in the next 24 to 36 months because I think there's enough liquidity to keep it yeah. going a little longer. Capital needs a home. But after that, I'm a believer that we will probably see a major, major, major correction. Now, for equities, my thesis has been we are very close to the top in the S&Ps. The way these companies have earned, you know, the, the, the PEs that they have is that they buy back, you know, they borrow money at, you know, whatever, two and a half, three percent. They inflate their dividend and spend like crazy. They buy back the stock. So when you're buying millions and millions of shares of your stock, it can do no other way than to go straight up. So now that that party, I believe, is coming close to the end, I think actually the government may stick their, their unfortunately, tentacles in there and, see, and, and, and basically they may limit how much one company can buy back their stock. I've heard this is like rumor. It's a talk on the street. Rumor. Yeah, yeah rumor. It's, it's rumor. But, it, but, but think but about it. Buy a rumor, sell but, but think about <laughs> it. It, it. It could happen. So 12 months uh, equity, uh, I would say I am anywhere from... From down ten to up ten, so not dr- range. not dramatic, yeah. not dramatic. Now, if you speak about twenty twenty one, I'm probably much more in the camp of you know a thirty to forty percent correction in the equity market yeah. and a major correction in the bond market, and not so interest rate driven. I think people are going to worry that the United States, like every other country, has printed too much money Default. and their bonds are through the roof and they may not be able to service. So the, do you see rates going back to yeah. uh, mortgages 6, 7, 8, 9%? I think so. Wow. I don't know about 6 to 9, but I mean, I could certainly, uh, I could certainly see 5. I could we get cer- 5 fourth quarter last yeah, year? Yeah, I, I could certainly see five, five, 5 to 7, for sure. Yeah, I mean, why why should our rates be this low? It's yeah. ridiculous. It's artificially inflating the market. It's totally it's it's one hundred percent. So we close up each show with one piece of advice that you 
leave listeners with to deposit that to their brain, right? Mm-hmm. To hopefully implement or improve their everyday life. Now, a lot of people say, hey, learn these five things, read this book of 200 pages. There's too much noise, if you will. So when you ignore the crowd and you eliminate the noise, what's the one thing you want people to take away after listening to today's episode? Read the mortgage quarterback. (laughs) That's terrible (laughs) advice. Don't read it. What's your real advice that you want to give people? One piece of advice. One. One One, One piece of advice. I think it's really what I said earlier is to find a style and strategy for your life that fits your personality. Don't try to be like you or someone else. Find the thing, the strategy and the style that fits your personality and go with that because that's going to be your best asset for the rest of your life. That's valuable advice. One last question so people go laugh. How long did it take for me to get you to actually like me? Like, like genuine like. So you don't just let people into your life like you let me in. So I liked you. I liked you right off the bat because we didn't know each other, right. and we were sitting in Rayos, right. and, and the wine was flowing. Yeah. Um, then for a short period of time, I didn't. Not, I wouldn't say I didn't like you. I, 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 you were. You didn't understand my style. I didn't. I didn't get you yet, um, and that took a little while for us to figure out how we can maximize our relationship. Once we found out how we could maximize our business relationship, all of a sudden the friendship came along and it's basketball and it's going to a game and it's, and it's hanging out. And um, I think it was actually, not, I could be wrong, but we were sitting in a meeting in your office and I said, we need to make this process digital. I feel like that caught your interest when I said we need to bring a digital concept to the hard money lending space. Well, listen, you've, you, you've done extremely well with your whole digital advertising, your whole, you know, your, your whole social media. I, I give you a ton of credit for that. I mean, what you get on that, what you get on your different applications is, 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 is phenomenal. And because I'm one generation away from you, I never believed in it, but now I more than believe in it. I believe in it wholeheartedly. Well, the results are in the pudding. It, the results are in the pudding. I mean, I think we're closing a loan with you. Uh, I think that loan came from uh, Instagram. Instagram. Yeah. So now you're unknown guy. You're getting you know a million dollar loan. That's a really good loan. I don't know what, how big that one was, but it doesn't matter. We're get we're getting it from Instagram. Yep. So there's no middle. There's no middle. You know, we're 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 much more productive. We're we're dealing directly with the borrower. So um, I would say that I liked you from <laughs> from the from the start. And the more that we get to know each other, um, I look at you as a little brother or. Or the, or the son it's I never had. It's a hybrid, right? It's good. Yeah. Well, listen, I value you probably just as much as anybody else does, probably as much as your kids do. Um, and like I said, I appreciate you taking the time out of your day to come on this show. I hope everybody that listened learned something. Uh, if you do ever have the opportunity to meet Mike, I hope you take full advantage of that and respect his time. Um, other than that, you know, we are actively lending in the hard money space. Um, TradeXRealty.com. You can go check it out. If you go on there, you will receive a special discount if you put that you listen to this podcast. Uh, maybe we'll waive a deposit or you know lessen your points and fees for you. So, um, Mike, thanks so much for coming on today's show. I hopefully you enjoyed it, and congratulations again on your daughter's engagement. Thank you so much, Jeff. I can't wait. Let's do it again. Round two. Thank you.